when I was in high school, I remember running stairs one day and, and one of my teammates, I would skip the last stair, I would just kind of stick my foot out and tap it. And she looked at me and she said, someone else is taking that stair today. If you want to be the best in the world, you have to know without a shadow of a doubt that you worked harder than anyone else in the world today. When you find something that you love and you do it as your work, you never work a day in your life. When you think about what you want out of life, where you want to make your mark, you have to start figuring out who you are. Where can you be great? And, not, and when you do that, you have to put the blinders on. Don't look at anyone else because nobody else can tell you how to be you. And I think a lot of times that we try to go outside of what we're naturally drawn to, what we're naturally gifted at, and we try to find something else that doesn't necessarily fit our skill set or something that we don't have a passion for because we see someone else doing it. But each of us are uniquely made and, and, and we have talents and different things that we love. So for me, I jumped everywhere that I went. If I tried to compose a symphony, I would have struggled. <laughs> For me, it wasn't just the people who had amazing talent. I think that anybody could have amazing talent, but the people that took that amazing talent and actually cultivated it and did something with it. And so that's why I was attracted to Michael Jordan. He would have been amazing as a basketball player in and of itself, but his defined work ethic was unparalleled by anyone. I heard about when he played in the NBA Finals with food poisoning, helping his team win, and how he never missed practice. And I took that to heart as a youngster, and I realized that I had to be relentless each and every day. But once I made my first Olympic team, I wasn't even thinking about what going to the Olympics would actually look like. I was thinking about just making the team. And immediately after making the team, I was filled with joy, but then a huge wave of emptiness came in and confusion, like, oh my gosh, what's next? And I understood that you had to start making new goals immediately once you achieve the ones that seem so unreachable. And so being able to go to four Olympic Games, win 12 U.S. national championships, it was a consistent, repetitive action of setting goals over and over again. Some large, some small, but being a habitual goal setter is what I attribute to being able to have such longevity in this sport. So when I was learning about doping and the fact that other people were cheating, I went back to my coach and I felt like I was at such a disadvantage. And I said, oh my gosh, everyone's cheating. There's no way that I could beat them. And my coach sat me down and said this. He said, look, you can't control what other people are doing. All you can do is control what you are doing. If you mentally tell yourself that everyone else is cheating, you're already telling yourself you can't beat them. So it's better for you to, to assume that they're not cheating and figure out how to beat them with your hard work and your work ethic. And so from the very beginning, I got amazing advice that put me on the right track to not so much focus on what other people are doing. It's easy to kind of give into the excuses or it's easy to feel like, you know, look at an elite athlete and feel like there's nothing that you could take from their journey that you could apply to your own life. But there's solid principles that apply through every facet of life that genuinely start with kind of setting a goal and sticking to it and just being accountable for what you say that you're going to do each and every day. So after I watched that Olympic Games when I was four years old, I kind of think of it as like, okay, that was God's grace of giving me something to hold on to because at that time period, my mother met my stepfather. Um, he was a strong alcoholic, a strong football player who um, used my mom as his punching bag. And being a young girl, seeing my mom abused so violently um, left its mark on me. So going to school was my escape. I realized that education was the only way that I was gonna make sure that I didn't live up, I didn't grow up in a household where my kids were wondering where their next meal was gonna come from. I wanted to make sure that I put myself around people that didn't value alcoholism or drug abuse and I really started paying attention to the university system and seeing that when people genuinely put action to the point of wanting to change their lives, they went and dedicated themselves to education. And so that's what helped me find that I wanted to go to school too. And I, and I really started finding school as my sanctuary. It was a place where I could you know, develop in athletics and sports, but also to train my mind to be an intellectual so that I wouldn't have to repeat these cycles of abuse in my own life. 
And I think that, that that's really what's catapulted me through all the different years of trials, tribulations. I dealt with homelessness and poverty growing up, domestic violence, growing up in a home with a lot of drug abuse and alcoholism. But I had that vision of going to the Olympics and I had that, that skill of jumping. I put those two things together and it was really the thing that pulled me through those difficult times. And I think that when people have those difficult times, you have to have something that is that brings hope and joy and and has the power to propel you through difficult situations because each and every one of us has them but we have to be able to see outside of it and when we lose hope that's when we feel like giving up and I think sometimes we have this situation right in front of us and it seems so big and so earth-shattering and we feel it's just a huge stumbling block um, of us being who we want to be or being a contributor to the society as a whole. And I think that if we, we stop making small, minute issues into monumentous mountains in our life, we will live a more fulfilled, more happy life. And so that is the best advice I had ever received. Yeah, so your body completely changes after you have kids. Um, I remember after having my first child, my ankles were so weak and I needed to be able to put a tremendous amount of torque and force into the ground to be able to high jump. And I remember having to take it one step at a time. And I think that whenever we're at a certain level and for whatever reason we get knocked down, we just want to get back to that level so quickly. But we forget the process of being patient with ourselves and being very meticulous and strategic towards getting back towards where we want to go that we could injure ourselves or we put ourselves through a lot of mental anguish and so for me it was no different I wanted to put myself through that mental anguish and I had just jumped one of the best jumps in American history and yet now I'm struggling to jump a height that I cleared my freshman year of high school but I realized that I had to put one step in front of the other and I had to take it one day at a time. And by being consistent, I eventually was able to jump higher and get to the point where I qualified for the Olympic trials and then I qualified for the Olympic games. But I learned throughout that process. And a lot of people say hindsight is 2020 vision. And they say it in a negative way, like, oh, hindsight is 2020 vision. But it's the reality that you could take that 2020 vision, apply it to the next time and do it again without falling into the bear traps. And that's what I did from one Olympics to the next. I figured out a process that worked. Especially now more than ever, we see that people are losing hope. And they can't see beyond their current circumstances and they feel like, like their runway is too short. But um, I want to bring the fact that there is hope. There was a time period in my life where I decided that I didn't want to live anymore. And that was at that 20 year old age. That's why it was so easy for me to go back there and say, you know, and it was something dumb. It was a breakup. And just to see all the amazing and beautiful things that were waiting for me in life on the other side of that moment. I want people that are living in their 20 year old devastation to know that there's life on the other side of it and to hold on to hope. Like if she could do it, I could do it. If, if there were great things in her life after all she's went through, I could make it too. So that's my, I hope that's my legacy.